the Neanderthal genome. How the study of ancient DNA traces human origins. Svante Perbel, Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, Leipzig. When the wall came down, I was in Norway with a very good friend. We said we should take a plane to Berlin, but alas, we didn't, unfortunately. Okay, so let me start out then by reminding you about the fact that Neanderthals are these robust forms of humans and that they appear in the fossil record of Europe and Western Asia starting around three or four hundred thousand years ago. They live in this region of the world until they disappear around 30 or 40 thousand years ago in conjunction with that fully modern humans appear expanding out of the Middle East and Africa and spread across Eurasia. And you may of course ask why should we be interested in Neanderthals and in the Neanderthal genome? And to me there are at least two reasons for that. The first reason being that they are our very closest evolutionary relatives. So if we want to define ourselves from a genetic and biological point of view to say what is it really to be a fully modern human, it's the Neanderthals, our closest relatives, that we should compare ourselves to. The other reason may be that they were here until quite recently, until 1500, 2000 generations ago, and they are not here now. So the relevant question may be what happened to the Neanderthals? Particularly, there is a debate in paleontology since 20 or 30 years about if one mixed with Neanderthals when modern humans came or not, if they contributed to pe people today. So to ask, answer such questions, you need Neanderthal DNA, of course. So to get that, we can profit from work of technique development that have gone on in my lab since almost 30 years now. There are tricks to this, you have to work under clean room conditions, and so on, to avoid contamination. And we were very lucky to receive funding here in Germany in 2005 for a project to further develop these techniques and apply it to the Neanderthal genome. So we got a lot better in how we extract the DNA from the bones, how we convert it into form. We can feed into sequencing machines that determine DNA sequences. We also looked through a lot of different Neanderthal sites and bones, identified some from Croatia and Southern Europe that were particularly well preserved. And we then sequenced about a billion DNA fragments from these bones and mapped them to the human genome, taking into account that there may be errors or are typical types of errors in the sequences. So in 2010, we then had a first draft version of the genome and could begin to compare it to present day people and begin by asking the question, what about contributions to present day people? And what we then found was that there are chunks of DNA in people in Europe, for example, that were almost identical to the Neanderthal genome, so close so it has to come from the Neanderthals. So we found this in Europe, but even more surprising to us was that we found it also wherever we looked in Asia. Also in places such as China or Papua New Guinea, where Neanderthals had never been. So the model that came out of that was then one saying that if modern humans came out of Africa, the first place where they meet Neanderthals, probably in the Middle East, if those modern humans then mix with Neanderthals and can't go on to become the ancestors to everyone outside Africa, they can, so to say, carry with them this Neanderthal component out to parts of the world where there haven't been Neanderthals to the extent that everybody who had their roots outside Africa had between 1 and 2 percent of their DNA from Neanderthals. What we have, have we done since? In the last four years, we then produced a very high quality of the Neanderthal genome, as good a quality as it would determine from a person today. We have applied these techniques to other parts of the world, particularly Asia and particularly a site in southern Siberia in the Altai Mountains, a beautiful part of the world, where our Russian colleagues under Anatoly Derevyanko's uh, leadership in 2008 found a tiny little bone. It's a part of the last phalanx 
of a finger of a child. And we were able to sequence the DNA of this little ball and to our surprise found that it had a common ancestor with Neanderthals, but far back, much further back than any difference between two people that live today. So this is some new form of extinct humans, and we call them Denisovans after the first place where they were then found. And it was the first time, actually, that a new form of extinct humans were defined just from a genome sequence. So we now have then a good genome sequence from Denisovans, from Neanderthals, from two, three different Neanderthals, and we can begin to ask who were contributed to whom. So what we then find is what I already said, Neanderthals contributed to people outside Africa, one to two percent. We find that the Denisovans have also contributed, particularly to people who live in Oceania, so Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and quite a lot, up to four or five percent. There's a small contribution from Denisovans, also in mainland Asia, in Han Chinese, for example, of less than one percent. Neanderthals and Denisovans are mixed to some extent, and quite interestingly, is there a component in the Denisovan genome from something older that diverged earlier from the human lineage of a few percent. This is quite a complex picture, but the major take-home message is really that we have always mixed with each other, also in the past, at least to some extent. So, what are then the next walls in this field? There are really two things I want to bring up, and then they have to do with the functional consequences of what we see in these genomes. So, first of all, the functional contribution of these extinct forms to present-day people. You can now go across the genome of people who live today and see what parts come from Neanderthals. And if you do that, you will find that some segments of DNA are quite frequent in Europe or Asia. 60, 70 percent of people have them. And if you ask what genes are in those segments, you find that these are structural proteins expressed in skin and hair. So in the, few ne the next few years, I'm pretty sure we'll find out that some aspect of how our skin works or functions and our hair is of Neanderthal origin. More importantly, perhaps, there are variants of genes important in the immune system for how we fight viruses and bacteria that come from Neanderthals and Denisovans. In January this year, people discovered that a risk variant of a gene that caused type 2 diabetes, the type of diabetes you get at old age, that that variant comes from Neanderthals and is particularly frequent in Asia. It might be surprising that something that caused a disease has become frequent, but probably it's because of these variants were advantageous in other situations. You may speculate that they, that may have to do with starvation in this case. So this may be some Neanderthal adaptation to starvation in present-day people. There is an adaptation in Tibet in people for living at high altitudes where oxygen pressure is low, with less medical complications due to the low oxygen tensions. That adaptation was found this summer to be largely due to genetic variants that have come over from Denisovans, actually, into the ancestors of Tibetans. There is a picture emerging that when these modern humans come out of Africa, they mix with Neanderthals at least twice, probably more times, actually, and with Denisovans in the East, and actually pick up some variants of that are advantageous in the environment that these other extinct groups had lived for hundreds of thousands of years, variants that then are advantageous for these newcomers. The other question that I find almost more interesting is then, after all, to say what functions are truly unique to modern humans? So what have changed in the human genome since we separated from Neanderthals? And why is that interesting? I think it's interesting because there are some things that are, after all, quite unique to modern humans. The stone tools that the Neanderthals made at the beginning of their history, three, four hundred thousand years ago, and at the end of their history, three or four hundred thousand years later, were pretty much the same. Modern humans have been around, around 
100,000 years. And I think we all agree that our technology today is vastly different from what it was 100,000 years ago. So technology starts changing rapidly, after a while at least, when modern humans are around. Figurative art comes, that we see what it depicts, comes only with modern humans. And modern humans are, of course, the first form of humans that spread across the whole globe to every habitable part and become millions and billions of people, whereas Neanderthals was probably only a few hundred thousand maximum at any one time. So an idea is, of course, or a dream is, that some of the reason for this tremendous expansion of humans lies in something in our bio biology. And that may then be in these genetic changes that are present in all present-day humans and not in the Neanderthals. So, and we can now, with the genomes, ask what are those changes? And their number is actually not very large. It's just a bit over 30,000 changes. So you can look through them in an afternoon in a computer. And I think the challenge for the next five or ten years now is try to figure out what which of these changes are actually functionally important. So the last question is then, how will we study human-specific genetic changes? And that's not so trivial since we don't really have an animal model. So there are some people that say now that when we have sequenced the Neanderthal genome to high quality, that what we should do is to clone Neanderthals. And there are even professors at famous medical schools who go around and say that. And we can discuss that later, perhaps. I think both technically and ethically, it's unthinkable and impossible. But what can we hope to do, very briefly, in the next five or ten years? I think one way forward would actually be to find back mutations. When we in the future will sequence millions and millions of people in the clinic, we will find all mutations, actually, eventually, that's compatible with human life. And some of them will be back mutations to the ancestral state, so to say. One, there are also techniques now, of course, to engineer in specific changes. You can do that in stem cells that you then differentiate to, say, neurons or to differentiate to liver cells in vitro and study the effects of these mutations. And you can also explore, after all, animal models. You can put these changes into laboratory mice, combinations of changes also, and say Neanderthalize and humanize a mouse and compare the differences. So I hope I have then convinced you about that if you're interested in human evolution, particularly recent human evolution, it's very useful to have the Neanderthal genome because you can study the effect of the contribution of Neanderthals and other extinct forms of humans to present-day people. But you can also then focus on what is truly unique biologically to fully modern humans. But to understand that is not enough then to study the genomes. It will really take functional work. And the way forward with that is then to engineer in these changes in stem cells and to use humanized mice. And with that, I then thank you for your attention.